Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of February 20th, 2014. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I am presiding. Um, we traditionally open uh, at this point with public comment, and um, I have no one signed up for public comment, but if anyone in the, in the council chambers is interested in speaking for three minutes, you're welcome to. Does anyone want to speak? Jasper, come up and identify yourself and... Speak your piece. I was hoping I wouldn't be first tonight. You're only. <laughs> you're, <laughs> so you're first and last if that helps. I don't know. I'm sorry. I have to wait for this to power on, unfortunately. I can read what I wrote. Just do your best or wing it. We're all friends here. Yes, but I wasn't uh, paying that much attention the last half hour, so I have to retrieve it. One moment. No, nope, not connected. I learned this from Owen, so just because he's not a connection problem. <clears throat> I'm not connected yet. Can't get on. Do you want to just speak to the gist of it? It might not be as no, I have it now. It is. Yeah. Okay. So it it could have, should have, and might have been a beautiful day for walking. It was not, and uh, the reason it was not is because. Um, Essentially, the condition of the sidewalks made it so that the February sun wets shoes rather than dries them. And now, I will actually get into what I wrote. I rarely go a week without having to spend an entire conversation defending my decision to live in Northampton. New Yorkers say we're not cultured enough. Californians say we're not friendly enough. Even people who live here complain about the weather. Mostly, though, people say that I it's too expensive, and why don't I move to Florence or East Hampton or even Ashfield? Well, stupid, because I want to live in Northampton. And at the risk of coming across as if I wish to impart a lesson in elementary economics, I always patiently explain that the reason it's so expensive is because a lot of people want to live here. And I generally conclude by pointing out that if they didn't spend all their money on having a car, they could afford to live in Northampton too. I'm far from the only one. Our culture of inclusion and our high weirdo density makes the city an attractive place to live for the mentally and physically disabled. Our attitude towards infrastructure is quite callous, however, specifically with regarding people in wheelchairs who, unlike me, are flatly unable to climb over snowbanks or even change their own wet shoes when they get home. The plight of the disabled and those in wheelchairs will be a theme you'll see me bring back in regard to this topic. Um, but I'm here tonight to pay homage to the greatest mayor in American history, now U.S. Senator Cory Booker, who last year publicized the plight of those who depend on the government for their meals by taking the food stamp challenge, eating for a week on about $30, and encouraged other politicians to do the same. In the spirit of the senator's incredible courage and compassion, Tonight, I hereby present the No Car Challenge, in which I will ask members of the council, Mayor Narkowitz, and department heads to commit to going one calendar week without using a car to help contextualize the life that I and others lead as the, as the basis for my radical policy recommendations. It may prove nerve-wracking or difficult to the unaccustomed participant, but I'm here to tell you it's very doable. Just be glad I'm not asking you to take the wheelchair challenge. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you. And yes, we are all friends, but I still wanted to read it. Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak at this point? Well, it's 7.05, so we can actually convene the meeting. I will ask the secretary to please call the roll. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Charney? Present. Councilor Here. Councilor Charney? Here. Councilor Here. Councilor Here. 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 Everyone's, well, we have a quorum. Um, Council Murphy and Council LaBarge are excused um, and will not be here tonight. 
uh, we've also conveniently come up against the time that we scheduled. Uh, this is probably a first, Lisa, uh, for the poll petition. So, <laughs> uh, um, so I would like to call for the uh, to open the hearing. So moved. And second. All those in favor of opening the poll petition and uh, and wire locations for South Street, Northampton, Massachusetts, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, the proponent, please, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. We are requesting permission to set a poll on South Street. I believe it has here 112 feet. Oh, southwest, I think, of the center line of the intersection of Columbus Avenue. The purpose of this is to, there's an existing service to house number 171 that now crosses their roof. There really isn't a better way to get the power to, they're going to change this and and they're, they're changing the service. And once they change that, we like to get it off of, you know, roof crossings. There's a lot of old practices that we no longer have, and we, we like to correct those. And we would need the pole across the street in order to service the house properly. Um, are there any opponents? A, there's oh. a butter. Oh, there's a butter. Okay. Would you like to come up and just ask your question? So this is microphone. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could show them. On uh, sure, sure. Hi, t Tim. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, it's right between house number 171 and 179. It's somewhat what would be where the property line is, and um, it's on the town take. We have to notify abutters within. I think it's about three or four hundred feet. So I have, I have a map here too. There's a map. Oh. You can see yeah, the map. I even I even have the same oh, one right okay. here. So. Here's house number 171. 179 would be right here. And this is going to be in the town take, but it was it's it's really where kind of the property line would divide them. Mm -hmm. So that the service off at 179 could actually come from this pole too, as opposed to this long you know, stretch yeah. across South Street that would be supported by another pole. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Accept a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any questions of the petitioner? Uh, all those in favor of granting permission, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you for your time, Lisa. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good evening. <laughs> you too. Um, what's up next? We've got. Oh, this is um. This is notes and the mayor's here. If you have any questions relative to this, this is. Uh, uh, you're all in receipt of a memo about a remote meeting participation. Um, this is uh, Dear City Clerk Maza, I'm authorizing the use of remote participation in the city of Northampton pursuant to 940 CMR 29.10 by members of multiple member bodies as that term is defined in Section 1-715 of the Charter of the City of Northampton. All such remote participation shall be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Attorney General's Regulation 940 CMR 2910. Multiple member bodies must follow the below regulations when utilizing remote participation. This is a minimum requirement. A, members of a multiple member body who participate remotely and all persons present at the meeting shall be clearly audible to each other. B, a quorum of the body, including the chair or in the chair's absence, the person authorized to chair the meeting shall be physically present at the meeting location as required by Mass General Law 30A, Chapter 20D. Uh, C, members of the multiple member bodies who participate remotely may vote and shall not be deemed absent for the purposes of Mass General Law Chapter 39, uh, Section 23D. And D, a member may not participate remotely more than six times in a calendar year. Um, there's some other qualifications, and I can waive that, or if you're waive interested it. in hearing that, but essentially this, this is, of course, uh, is required by Mass General Law that the executive, <coughs> uh, or the executive body of the city has to authorize and prescribe the guidelines by which we can basically if a member's absent can Skype their participation, but it is to be used sparingly, not to suddenly have us all as a series of disembodied heads on a, in a meeting um, complaining about a bad connection. Right. 
Are there any questions? Uh, Councilor Spencer? Well, just one thing, that if we were to do something like Skype, it also everybody has to be able to both have the same access, correct? Correct. It, it, so that we'd have to make sure we set that up beforehand, that it's clear. And, yeah. I mean, I think another important element is not only the members of the body be able to hear, but the themselves, members but the of the public, public be able to hear. Yeah. Councilor Klein. I'm just wondering if we actually have the technological means by which to do this. Is this really a relevant oh. well, uh, it, proposal it's, for any time soon? It's challenging. It remains to be seen. For instance, if you're trying to go online right now, you'll find that you're probably not going to be able to because we are sharing the streaming um, with NCTV, and our capacity doesn't seem to be as such that um, we could do it in a sparkling fashion. Uh, but this is an anticipation we, of the technology. We, we may not be able to Skype, but we have for appointments committee, when we were interviewing not members of the committee, but people who were not present, we could do a conference call very easily. Right. So that, that we do have the technology. Skyping, I think, would be more problematic. So it's, it, we're on the cusp of, of being able to do this, I think. Um, you know, maybe part of the ascertainment process with the, the Mega Corporation Comcast, we can negotiate for better uh, streaming capacity and, and, and uh, bandwidth. Um, but for the time being, it's, it's good to have this rule in place. I mean, I think there will be, there will certainly be some occasions where um, the process would definitely benefit from um, having this available to us. And in fact, actually, this is part, actually, when I first got elected this is, as president, this is one of the things that I was eager to implement here in the city. Um, you know, it's taken us 10 years to go somewhat paperless. And that's a coup. <laughs> that's great. And, but I'd like to continue. I would just um, suggest if we're going to consider it for these chambers, um, I don't know if there is a dedicated phone line for this room. You know? There are Ethernet jacks. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, if we were to have I mean, it seems like conference call, phone call is the, is the least um, problematic. And we might want to look into having, you know, one of those put in for, for that purpose. Just one thing, later on the agenda, we are referring this to Ordinance Committee. No, no. And we can refer it with other suggestions. Out. Council this, this isn't getting referred, because no. this is the mayor's policy. I went and... I drafted what is, a, what is getting referred I then? drafted oh, a rule for the council because the mayor's policy actually doesn't apply to the council. Is it, it a similar to, rule? It applies to multiple member bodies of, of which we're not. It's a very similar rule. There's only okay. two small differences. But I don't I don't know if um if we can use like a speakerphone type situation. It, it has one of the requirements is it has to the person has to be clearly visible. Oh, so okay. I don't I don't think that it has to be teleconference. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that I'm just reading the technology section. And um, I, don't, I don't think that under this policy that, that would be up. Councilor O'Dell. Um, I, <clears throat> I just read this as um, under the technology section A2, it says clearly audible to one another. Yeah. I don't know if there is a visual requirement. When well, so well, maybe, well, when technology is in use, they must be clearly visible. So. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, you might need us. Do you have do you have some clarification? I think that refers to if there's a Skype happening. It has to be clearly visible. visible. So it's oh, tele telephone only can be okay. I believe, if I believe okay, so. okay, thank you, yeah, thank you. It just means that if you do do a televideo, it has to be everyone in the audience has to be able to see. Um, it can't be somebody's iPhone sitting there. Right. Well, I guess my point was then, if a teleconference is acceptable for multi-member bodies then for transportation and parking or planning board or something like that, it might be really helpful if we were to invest in, I don't think they're very expensive, but just one of those yeah. you know, genuine <coughs> teleconference <coughs> jacks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we clearly have, um, if, if, if those monies become available, then we clearly, you know, we have a good use for them. But. Uh, um, you know, this hasn't really come up much, the, the need for this. Um, I mean, tonight actually came flirtingly close. Yeah. If we had any other counselors missing, we, we would not have uh, had a quorum, and then it would have certainly been a benefit to have them represent themselves. They can't, they can't contribute towards a quorum, I don't think. They can't, oh, that's right, I'm sorry. That's right. You're right, you're right. They wouldn't be able to contribute towards a quorum. So, yeah. 
Well, and this is just for the multi-member bodies piece that we're hearing. We have to do the right. separate in, piece for the council. According to Mass General Law, and in, in the, in the, they require that the executive body establish this rule in order for it to be used. Right. So we're, we're not allowed by the state. <coughs> it needs to be essentially a directive from the executive side. But so we're right. not voting on this particular piece, no, but right. later a similar piece for the council is coming for informational okay. purposes only. So. Okay. Um, any other questions on this? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just curious if we know how many cities and towns in Massachusetts are actively using this or have used it. What? Just what out I of curiosity. Did research actually, you know, it was two years ago, two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. There were there were several. I don't really. Know the, um, for instance, Boston has, for some reason, has better facilities than we do, and I, I'm sure why that is. But um, and maybe Springfield soon will with the, the vast amounts of money they're going to realize, I'm sure it might be able to, but, mm -hmm. um, but there, it is growing. And, and, and there are a number of communities out in the western part of the state, west of us, who don't have, they don't even have broadband. So that it would be very difficult for them to do that. So, okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, <laughs> While we're clicking along here, the, this is the point in the <laughs> meeting where the mayor, if he has any presentations, I actually had asked the mayor if he would talk a little bit about the um, the Mass Gaming Commission appeal that the city advanced. And he'd be so kind to just, uh, I think we've been sort of subject, Mr. President. President, but. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, so as, uh, as all of you read, um, the Gaming Commission uh, held its uh, day-long hearing to review, uh, to deliberate on the petitions that had been filed by several communities across the Commonwealth. Uh, Northampton was one of them. We had two petitions. Um, I did not uh, drive to Boston, uh, but I did uh, watch the proceedings online. Um, and uh, essentially, they took up our first, our surrounding community petition. Uh, and uh, after very minimal uh, deliberation, uh, voted against it. Um, and then in short order took up our second petition, which was seeking reimbursement, which is allowed under the statute and under the regulations, uh, and they quickly dismissed that as well. Um, I, as I said in the, as it was reported in the paper, it was uh, somewhat surprising and, dis and disappointing at the same time. It, surprising because I think there was a majority on the body which um, did not agree with the MGM's contention that we were just geographically too far away. Um, three, at least three members conceded that we were close and that Western met 20 minutes, you know, in Western Mass is much different than being 20 miles away in, in Boston. Uh, one, one of the commissioners remarked that, you know, you could drive 20 minutes in Boston and not even leave your neighborhood. Um, so uh, several of them conceded that point. Then we quickly turned to the uh, economic analysis and uh, uh, and this argument had been telegraphed back in our here in our initial hearing when we went up against MGM. But essentially, uh, despite the fact that the regulation sh says that we have to demonstrate that there's a significant negative impact, which I believe we did, um, we were faulted for not um, showing enough positive impacts of casinos, um, and uh, which MGM had asserted somewhat broadly that there was going to. And this is essentially the. The sum total that I can find of the uh, positive economic impact information that they presented, which is this continuous mantra that there'll be $50 million um, in regional impact, impact on the region, investment in the region. Um, but there's not really any clear um, dollar figures, particularly nothing uh, specific to Northampton. Um, and so, uh, so that was sort of the basis of what they based their decision on. They felt that we were really overlooking the, the overwhelming positive impacts of a casino. They were also concerned that we were not taking into account um, all of the repatriated uh, casino customers that would be returning to Massachusetts from Connecticut. Um, and, uh, and that uh, and that that was a, a fatal flaw, I guess, in in our in our presentation. So they voted uh, not to designate us a surrounding community. Um, MGM, for its part, again uh, made its presentation previously. Uh, again, uh, did not really 
Uh, they disputed our findings, uh, and, and essentially their argument was we had ignored all the positive impacts, but again, I say did not, we presented a clear study. They didn't really present much of a study in terms of what the direct imp positive impacts to Northampton were. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the situation. There's no appeal of their decision, and I think, as I said, as I indicated in the, um, in the newspaper, I think, uh, I think the study um, does show some, does provide us with some valuable information about exactly what's at stake um, over the next several years in terms of what, uh, what, what, our, what our local economy is based on in terms of these local businesses that have, that have uh, made these investments in the retail industry and the entertainment industry and the many people who don't live in Northampton who come to Northampton and really help fuel our economy. So uh, we're going to have to refocus our efforts. We're going to have to, you know, work with, um, you know, the business community and uh, with the community at large over the next several years as this facility uh, gets up to speed to really focus on how do we uh, remain competitive now uh, with an $800 million uh, facility 20 minutes away um, uh, that will be clearly competing with us for, um, for the discretionary dollars in Western Massachusetts. So that's my brief report. I wish I had uh, better news to report. Um, but that's uh, that's 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 what I have to report. Uh, Councilor Adams, out of the total money that was spent, could you um, clarify how much was on the study and how much is on legal fees? Yeah, the study, um, uh, uh, the study itself, uh, we the it was seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, that was the Camoin study. Uh, that was the, the group that we had um, gone out to bid. I had come before you. Um, seeking authorization for $22,000 uh, because at that point we had three proposals um, and in order for me to award one I needed to have funding authorization. Um, uh, one of the proposals was uh, six figures so that one I didn't ask you for authorization of six figures um, but uh, there were two proposals and uh, the max ceiling was 22 so we went with the 17.5 we went with Camoin uh, and it wasn't based on price it was based on who we thought could had the experience and had the ability and I and I think they had both and I think they did an outstanding job on a very short time frame the uh, on the legal side the fees on the legal side we're trying to f get those finalized I believe that the final total on the legal side and this is again uh, using outside counsel I believe it's twenty nine thousand two hundred and fifty dollars is the total there we had submitted an estimate to the Gaming Commission two months ago for legal which was twenty five thousand um, and that was sort of our working number we had to submit uh, what we believed our expenses were so um, so that's what it came in on the legal side so that's uh, that's what it uh, that, that's what was involved I will say that as I had said at the outset um, that I had, uh, before I even came to you for funding, I had reached out to, um, to members of the business community uh, to try to get some support for helping to fund the study. Um, and in the wake of the decision, I've been in contact and those commitments are there. And we, I fully expect that we will, um, and I'll be able to report to you when I complete that, that we will be um, uh, receiving some contributions from the local business community to help us defray the costs, uh, particularly of the study. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's the, I, I can give you a, b a better accounting of that um, when the time when I when I have all that information. Um, Are there any other questions? You. And I and I just want to say I appreciate the support of the council in in helping us move forward because I, I I don't regret it. I think it was the right thing to do. I believe we had a good case. I believe we uh, had we made the case that there was going to be a significant economic impact. Unfortunately. Uh, it, it seems after watching them over the last several months, the Gaming Commission, uh, their mission seems to be um, to support the gaming industry and uh, to make sure that they, they, you know, make no bones about the fact that they believe uh, gaming is going to be this incredible economic boon for, uh, for the Commonwealth. And uh, again, the thing that was particularly troubling is we're having this whole discussion about repatriation of Connecticut dollars at the same very moment that the Connecticut casinos are reporting revenues that are down, they're laying off people, they're openly saying that they're applying for the Massachusetts licenses pretty much to stop the bleeding in Connecticut financially um, and to deal with their debt uh, problems that they have. 
And there's reports all around the country of, uh, you know, whether it's Michigan, uh, MGM Casino in Michigan in Detroit is down 6% this year revenue-wise because there's new casinos in Ohio that were just built. Um, same story in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Uh, and, um, and so the idea that somehow, um, you know, the, the MGM officials were talking about, we're, you know, we're, we're going to be bringing all of these visitors from not only around the country, but international visitors uh, um, to Springfield. And you can go to the Baltimore Sun and you can hear them stand before the Gaming Commission in Baltimore and, uh, or in Maryland, and they're saying the exact same things there that we're going to be, this is going to be a one-of-a-kind facility. We're going to bring all these international visitors to your, you know, so it's, uh, so anyway, uh, it gets a little frustrating. So that, that's the other part that I think that um, the Gaming Commission is in a little bit of a bubble uh, in terms of uh, what's going on in the outside real world in the gaming industry. And the council president uh, posted a, a spot-on article in Time Magazine about just the fact that, you know, you know, the casino industry is going down, and people are saying, "Let's build more casinos." So, comes right. If after a casino happens in Springfield, if we is there a point later on down the road, if we are negatively affected as we expect, that we can um, make another request to the to the commission? Yeah, and and the commissioners took great pains to point out. Uh, uh, um, when they rejected others, that that there is a mitigation fund of between, I believe, uh, 15 to 20 million dollars uh, that is going to be set aside uh, for the future, um, and that that there's an opportunity to seek mitigation at that point. I will say one of my concerns, and having just gone through this process, is how will communities a how will communities um, monitor that or study that or prove that to the Gaming Commission because presumably you're going to have to have some way to independently verify that there's been this impact um, and, uh, and, then, and then you're going to have to you know make the case for you're going to have to go before the Gaming Commission you know again up against uh, the, the, uh, the licensee at that point and, uh, and try to make the case so and actually the Gaming Commission um, and this is a trend this is a trend with this body uh, they actually haven't developed those rules yet they're going to start discussing them now they haven't actually told us what the what the process is going to be what the rules are going to be um, I was on the phone today with the mayor of West Springfield who was calling to um, send his condolences um, and he's actually in negotiations with uh, with MGM right now and was commenting on the fact that these dollar amounts that many of the other communities have agreed to you know a hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever you know may not even you know may only scratch may help at best to pay for studies to monitor the impacts going forward um, you know because that's you know that that how else will we be able to make a case to the Commission that we've been impacted um, and clearly it doesn't seem as if they're going to do it for us and they're certainly not going to require at least from my experience they're not going to require the gaming facility to do it um, so that's a, that's there's a fund but the devil is in the details so we'll have to see how that plays out my frustration comes from <clears throat> the fact that the reason the gaming commission was established was when we were originally sold the fact that we were going to get casino <clears throat> that there had to be some essentially steward for the communities and the communities that might suffer um, adverse impacts from, from casinos. And that was the purpose and the charge of the Gaming Commission was, first of all, to make sure the process was clean and just and right for and <coughs> keep organized crime out and so on and so forth, and also to protect the surrounding communities that may be impacted. The fact that they start from the premise by abiding by by literally regurgitating the promotional materials from MGM is not a good sign. They, they are not good stewards. They failed us enormously here. Not, not only us, but also all the surrounding communities, and that's including the abutting communities like uh, Longmeadow and Ludlow and West Springfield. Just as you say, that the, the settlements are, uh, they're, they're not even, they're, principally for traffic mitigation. They don't even discuss economic impacts. The only economic impact that they suggest exists is one of great great bounty, that we're going to suddenly realize uh, a whole new change in, in, in our, uh, the topography of our economic region. 
And the thing that's also particularly galling is we presented a study we did, we abided by and presented our appeal in good faith. Subsidized, uh, we have business members and the community willing to invest the money against a large corporate investment to counter them on making this appeal before a board that was supposed to essentially be serving us. And instead we got, I, I, I don't know, maybe I think you're, you're disguising your frustration and anger better than I'm going to because I think that they, they treated us with disdain, diffidence, and contempt. They were patronizing. I mean, this, this quote here, this is a sop. This is supposed to make us feel better, and this one was actually featured in the editorial in the Republican today talking about why it was a good decision. Uh, as another commissioner from the eastern part of the state noted, on any visit to a Springfield casino, his wife would insist on stopping in Northampton. Well, how thoughtful. <laughs> I think that's great, and that's reason. I, I think we can start counting the dollars now that we'll start pouring in from some Boston-centric person, commissioner's wife, maybe might stop by and just see how we, you know, how we've mastered fire. The commissioner did point out, however, that under ethics laws, he's barred from visiting a casino. So right, he is. Anyway. Well, that's good. I'm glad he's. I'm glad he. Hypothetical. I'm glad he appreciates that conflict. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that he can have his wife, he will send his wife as a surrogate to go play the slots in a casino, which she's more likely to go to the two Boston locale ones. It's just, it's just particularly galling because it reinforces my sense of the distance by which we are governed in Boston how the center of gravity focuses on the most wealthy, most populous city in the state. And we are literally considered to be rubes, and we are treated as such. And that just sticks in my craw and has made me apoplectic. One other fact that came out, I just want to add just one other thing, one other fact that came out during the testimony, and they had, um, this was sort of generalized testimony for their, all the surrounding communities, they had the commission's own director of research and uh, problem gaming, um, who they've hired to do this research, he testified before the committee because they have different. There were different factors that they had to look at for impacts, and one of them were the social and problem gambling impacts. And he very nonchalantly said, "You know, Mr. Chairman, we've done a review of the literature, and uh, and and what we conclude is that um, when a new facility is constructed, there is a." Um, doubling of problem gambling within a within a 50 mile radius of this new facility, um, and there was you know sort of very little discussion about that. It was you know put out there, and then they moved on to the next topic. So the costs to be borne by the community. so anyway that I mean that that's another piece of this that you know I, I, I we've obviously focused on the economic impacts, but there's a lot of other social impacts that also have that also discussed. translate into economic yeah. impacts as well. I mean and, that, and that's, the, that's and the behavioral health services that will need to be provided to address those concerns. So anyway, I, I don't want to okay. turn this into a, um, uh, a bashing okay. session. Um, but that's my report on the on the Thank commission, you. and we'll continue to monitor it, and um, and we'll keep you apprised if there's new developments. Uh, any other council? Any other questions? I just have a really quick comment. It's interesting what you just said about the 50 mile radius of the the um, increase of uh, addiction or whatever it may be. So they recognize there the 50 mile radius, but yeah. the 20 mile radius for economic impact isn't recognized. So. Seems like a double standard. Well, that was the conundrum that we tried to put forward to them: was that you, that we can't be close enough to just have positive impacts, but have no negative impacts. I mean, that was MGM's argument: that they're close enough to be positively affected, but they're too far away to be negatively impacted. So it was, and and I I I submit that they never overcame that, and that we proved otherwise. But um, but unfortunately, you're not the gaming commission, so. Councilor. Um, just having seen some of the uh, concessions they made to surrounding cities, so Holyoke um, was the guarantee, I guess, of, of jobs, of hiring of, of Holyoke residents and, an, uh, what, an $85,000 annual um, contribution to city government. But um, there was no indication, not that it's something that would be any comfort here, that there might be at least uh, a preference for hiring from for Northampton citizens or anything like that? <coughs> There's no indication of anything? Nope. They, um, uh, 
Uh, I can tell you that that MGM officials have been um, have met with several restaurant tours in town, um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not to hire people. It's I think to see if they want to come set up restaurants in in Springfield. Um, but I'm not aware of any. There, there certainly were no guarantees made uh, regarding hirings in Northampton in the discussions that we had. I, just one other comment to 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 put perspective on this. The casino was protected by the state mandated, protected from any competitive interests. There are no other casinos that can build close to this one in this state because the state has determined that we will only have three. The large mega corporation has, is sanctioned by the state and protected from competitive interests, and that same protection is not shared among any other enterprise, local business owners in this region, in this valley. And that's what's so maddening here, because that is what the, com the commission was supposed to address that disparity. And they only, dis they only address it by offering monies for traffic mitigation proximate to Springfield. And that's especially galling. We have, we have created a, a profoundly dysfunctional system that is antithetical to free market, it's antithetical to uh, a good enterprise, and it's also, it's, it's in, intensely cynical way to generate revenue for a state, which is basically exploiting people and ho I mean, trying to lure people back in and exploiting their hopes and dreams, and the same with the communities that they promise to invest in, uh, without providing any real robust economic value. And that just makes me nuts. And we'll leave it at that. That'll be the end of the bashing festival. Well, uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to bash, too, if I may. Go, please. <laughs> just, just, a, just a quick yeah. bash. Um, I, I would just observe that I mean, you have these corporate interests who spent enormous sums of money on TV ads and propaganda. And it just stands in such, to get, the, get what they wanted, and it just stands in such stark relief to the small amount of money Northampton spent to find facts. And you know which guess which side won out in this case, but in any case, I uh, applaud you for fighting the good fight against enormous odds. I think. And the house always wins. Does <laughs> <That's the house. laughs> win? Hmm. Uh, okay, thank you, Your Honor. Do you have any other things? Um, well, next up, we um, we have no proclamations, right? No proclamations or anything. Okay, and no licenses and petitions. Uh, I will accept a motion for the approval of minutes. Move to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion about the minutes? No. All those in favor? Did we skip over one minute announcements. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, well why, why don't we do this vote? All those in favor okay. of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, one minute announcements. Councilor uh, Klein. Yeah, two quick things. I'll um, bring this up at the next meeting, too, because this is the end of March. But on Tuesday, March 25th, at 7 o'clock at the Leeds School, um, together, I, together with the uh, Leeds Civic Association, are co-sponsoring a meeting about the extension of the Mass Central Rail Trail, better known as the bike path, um, through Leeds and uh, all the way into Aidenville. Um, and that will be with Wayne Fiden from the planning department. Um, so put that on your calendars, folks. And um, we really want to encourage all of the counselors and everybody watching at home, we really need applicants to the parking committee and the public transportation committee. Um, and for the public transportation committee, particularly folks who are heavy users of the PBTA, is there anything else, Ryan, that you want to say about that as the chair of that committee? No, I don't think so. Commission, I should say. That's it. Any other announcements? Councilor Spector, you didn't have an announcement? No, I was just uh, <laughs> you know, just trying to keep with the process. Okay, okay thank you for <laughs> keeping me honest. Uh, okay. Uh, now we're up to the reports of committee's appointments and elections. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, we have, uh, let's see, four? For the minutes for economic development, uh, housing, and land use uh, minutes, and also <coughs> ordinance and appointments, and evaluations, and social services and veterans affairs. These are of the months November, December, and October for 
Move as a group. The motion's been made to move them as a group. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> now, um, this is an application to uh, boards and committees and commissions. Uh, we have Alan Verson of it be a new appointment to the planning board of 508 Kennedy Road in Leeds, term starting of this month and going to March 2015 to fill the unexpired associate term of Ann DeWitt uh, Brooks. And this has been recommended by the Committee on Rules, Orders, and Appointments. I'll accept a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion on the, the, uh, on the candidate? All those in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And this is a new appointment to the planning board, and this is for referral. Um, William Grinnell, 49 Beacon Street in Florence, a term uh, beginning this month as well, and March 2019. <coughs> and that's filling the expired term of Jennifer Darren. Move to refer. Second. All those in favor of referral, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Extensions. This is um, this is a new appointment to the Agricultural Commission. This is uh, Margaret Gifford of 80 Locust Street. The term beginning this month, 2014, uh, and going to September 2017. And that's filling the expired term of John Kelly, uh, SVA uh, Smith Vocational's represent representative. And this is also up for referral. So. And move to refer. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Then we have uh, reappointments to the Board of Public Works. Mary John Adams Pullen of 60 Norwood Avenue, Florence, of the term beginning March 2014 to March 2017. Uh, Michael Parsons at 28 Bayberry Lane, Florence, uh, term uh, starting March 2014 and going to March 2017. And Rosemary Schmidt, 16 Grandview Lane in Florence, <coughs> term starting March 2014 and going to March 2017. Move to suspend Rule 30. Second. There's been a motion made and seconded to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Do you want to vote on the reappointments? I'll move them as a group. As a group. Second. Any discussion? Um, Council Specter, would you please speak to the? I would say they're all. I strongly support all three of these folks, and uh, hope you will all vote for them. They've done a great job. Suspend rule thirty. Yeah, we did, did. suspend rule thirty. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? these? Are all uh, people who've been currently serving on the on the board of public works, and this is an extension of their terms. Okay. <coughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> <clears throat> okay. Now, normally this is where we will recess for finance. The chair of finance is not present tonight. In fact, actually, we don't have a quorum. So, I, but I will defer to uh, the vice president, who uh, is the de facto chair of, of finance. What's your pleasure here? I think we should just move them all into the regular um, into the regular full council meeting. Um, I'm not sure if that requires a, a suspension of the referral rule. Are these actual referrals? Do these, uh, I mean, these weren't referrals from the council, right. right? So I don't, I don't. These are financial orders from the mayor's office. So the, so they're not referrals. So they would have automatically defaulted to a referral from the, from finance. I don't, I don't think we need a, a rule suspension. Um, I think we, we should just move. Just them. go going back into the regular. Yeah. Room. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we'll, we won't recess into finance. And I, and I think we've done this once before, mm -hmm. um, the absence of a quorum for finance. So we'll just go directly to the financial orders. And Your Honor, and also David Pomerantz is here, and I'd ask if you would move to recognize him. Move to recognize David Pomerantz. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Um, and Your Honor, please, uh, please speak to um, the first order. Uh, certainly. So I believe the first order, I uh, just want to make sure I'm going by, this is the, um, this is, I, I'm sorry, this is the, the $3,000 expenditure and gift funds. Okay. So did you want to, did you want to have a motion before I do that? Or? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to yeah, prep you. So he, okay, sure. First of a motion, put this on the floor. So moved. Second. Okay. I just didn't want to, um, 
Okay, so um, essentially the, um, the Recreation Commission uh, received a gift um, from the Cronin uh, Gift Fund. Uh, I believe the total is 13,000. I don't have the, I can get you the exact number. I have it here in my notes. But essentially, um, in order for the gift to be expended, um, by the Recreation Commission, it requires a vote of the council. And so the order before you <coughs> is to um, expend $3,000 um, from those gift funds uh, to provide scholarships to uh, recreation uh, department uh, uh, participants. Um, and so that is the purpose of tonight's, uh, of this particular transfer. So it's a gift that was already made and received, um, and it was designated for this purpose. Um, we're allowed to receive, cat, take in cash gifts, but in order to expend them, we need to come to uh, the council to, to do that. Great. So that's the purpose of this. So the, sorry, the entire gift, um, whatever the amount was, is for scholarships? Yes, and there's a fund that's been established, and I believe each year uh, the Recreation Department allocates so much for scholar, available scholarship money. Okay. Um, and I believe this is a family gift fund that was made for this purpose. So that's what they're requesting. Any questions? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, it's financial. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, yes, roll call, please. Mr. Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay. So the next financial order is the, that we have on our agenda is the, uh, the replacement, renovation, and modernization of the school facility systems. Uh, you want to speak to that and, and I will and I will recognize Mr. Palmer it's uh, just just to set the stage there's two somewhat identical uh, resolutions and the language is fairly identical and this is language that's prescribed by the Massachusetts School Building Authority um, and this is a required vote of the council uh, to be able to file an application uh, uh, a notice of, of interest to their program and I'll have Mr. Pomerantz describe the two projects and what uh, the potential benefit is. A vote of the city uh, school committee uh, is also required and that vote actually was taken last night uh, unanimously by the school committee on each one of these. So um, I will ask, ask Mr. Pomerantz to come up and just explain the, the actual details of those two capital projects. Can I ask one question before sure. you do the uh, ease? Is the prospect of this grant the thing that's driving these projects, or are the projects actually? No, these are projects, as Mr. Pomerantz can, can tell you, have been on the capital plan for some time, uh, and they're very large-scale projects. And what's really changed is the MSBA, um, uh, you know, which we know of traditionally for building new schools or doing major renovations, has now restarted this, um, this repair program which actually provides access to funds for repairs to things like roofs and boilers, et cetera. Um, so uh, I'll have him describe for you the cost here and the scale of the project and the fact that these are high priority projects uh, for the school department. So. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, everybody. Dave Pomerantz from Central Services. Good to see everybody. Um, as the mayor said, these are two large capital improvement projects that have been on the uh, rotating five-year capital plan for quite some time. Uh, both the roof systems at Ryan Road and Leeds uh, are prime for replacement. Uh, Ryan Road was last installed in 1989. Leeds was done in 1991 when the building was expanded and renovated. Um, we're looking at approximately 47,000 square feet of roofing and accompanying materials at Ryan Road and about 28,000 square feet of at Leeds that would be removed and replaced. Uh, total combined cost, we're looking at about $1.1 million worth of work. Um, so to look for just uh, sort of internal funding from capital, uh, like I said, they've been on the schedule for some time. Uh, they need to be done. And we now have an opportunity from MSBA uh, with this sort of reconstituted accelerated repair program uh, to get on the invitation list and participate in that program. Uh, 
the accelerated repair program covers building envelopes, so roof stores, windows, boilers, things like that. And we have already submitted the sort of first uh, amount of information electronically to MSBA. That was done on the 14th. Uh, those are two preliminary, what are called statements of interest. Uh, in order to submit the final hard copy packages, uh, which are due by the 28th, uh, we needed both uh, authorization votes from the school committee and the city council to authorize the superintendent to submit, actually submit those packages. And as the mayor said, um, the school committee did vote last night, and we're here tonight asking for your support and an authorization vote. Um, once our packets are in, uh, hopefully the city gets invited to participate. It's an 18-month process from start to finish when the work needs to be completed. And in conversations we've had with the MSBA staff in Boston, uh, based on school district parameters that they use, uh, Northampton could be looking at a 56% contribution from SB, MSBA towards the overall construction cost, about $600,000 of the $1.1 million. So uh, we definitely want to pursue this as aggressively as we can. So with your vote tonight and with the authorization, uh, the superintendent will submit the packages by the 28th, and we should hear within probably uh, a month at the most, uh, whether Northampton is invited to participate. Are there any questions? The, um, what's the average life? Uh, 1989 for uh, a non permeable root membrane is an awfully long time. That's, <coughs> I don't, I, you know, it's, I would imagine it's expired. Uh, lifetimes occurred some time ago. Are you t you're, you're talking uh, anywhere based on element conditions and uh, are there roofs nearby that are shedding more water and ice onto the, onto the particular surface? 25 plus years. Uh, so we're definitely at that spot. Um, there are sections of leads where the rubber is beginning to deteriorate so you can see the fiber in the material. Uh, we're patching things diligently, uh, knock on wood, not had any substantial issues uh, because of the deteriorating nature of the roofs. We do have to replace ceiling tiles here and there uh, in the building because we get some moisture coming through. But uh, rubber will last a long time, but it ends its life at some point. D David, I have to ask if we don't, we don't qualify, we don't get the fund. <clears throat> Are we still committed to seeing the project through out of out of our own funds? We have to see how the capital committee and the final prioritization of for fiscal 15. Uh, we are starting work at Ryan Road this spring on phase one with capital money that was allocated in fiscal 14. So we'll be doing uh, $150,000 worth of work on that roof this spring but we still have the rest of the uh, square footage to do. Uh, Councilor Carney and then Councilor O'Donnell. Uh, are we taking into consideration for just for possible future installation um, design of these roofs or use of roof products that will accommodate solar panels or anything like that for future? Or are, are we not even near that, that phase of um, concept? concept? It's always something we would like to look at down the road as far as putting photovoltaics on the flat roofs. Uh, with the technology advancing, as I'm, I'm sure you know a lot about, Councillor, um, there are now rack systems that can be laid right on top of uh, a rubber membrane. Um, we're going to be looking at Bridge Street School probably five years down the road for their roof, and they're now producing photovoltaic uh, cells within rubber roof membranes. Right. So uh, it's something we definitely want to look at doing. Councilor okay. O'Donnell. My, my question was similar. Um, <clears throat> is part of this grant, is it, is it, is it reduction of, of energy um, usage? Is, is part of the goal of this grant to help schools uh, reduce the, their energy costs? Like when you look at something like a roof and the heat um, that a roof loses, I, I just note that you said you conducted a thermal assessment of the underside of the roof. I'm wondering if that, that kind of operational savings into the future is part of um, 
at part of Ryan, your plan and if you, excuse me, if, at sorry. Ryan Road, um, we're lucky that the current insulation levels in the roof are just shy of the existing building code requirements for the depth of insulation we need. So we would not need to upgrade or increase the depth of the insulation on that roof. So that's a plus. Um, so if we're meeting the insulation, the R value levels uh, at Ryan Road, we won't have to increase the insulation. Uh, there are some areas at Leeds where we will have to increase the insulation when we replace that roof. So as part of the project, yes, uh, if we need to upgrade the insulation levels, we'll have to do it. Any other questions? I just want to emphasize, too, uh, just to put it in perspective. I mean, our, our capital plan last year was about 1.5 to 1.6 million total for the capital plan. And that's sort of so uh, the opportunity to receive, you know, 56% funding of a, of a $1.1 $1 million, uh, two, one point, two projects totally $1.1 million are, is significant, which is why I think I support us making this application to see if we can get in the pipeline for it, um, because these are, you know, these are these are repairs that have to be made. So if the state is willing to help us pay for over half of it, I think we should avail ourselves of it. And just to be clear, the result of this vote is to authorize an application. Exactly. Moving fund. Exactly. There's no there's no authorization or borrowing order or anything like that before you. Um, and your request is for two readings tonight because of it the is deadline. yes uh, it is uh, and um, so that would be if we could get two readings again there's no financial commitment here it's just this is required um, initially we, we were there was a there was a when we were looking at the time frame we weren't should we I think the understanding was it just was require a school committee vote but then upon further research uh, determined that it needed both school committee and uh, city council so I'm glad that the school committee wasn't snowed out last night because it, it got rescheduled last week to last night. So uh, this is like a back-to-back -back approval. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Um, I'm going to ask the clerk. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Can, can we take them as uh, we take both of them together? There needs to be two separate, separate two separate readings. There must be two that. separate votes. Okay. So I'll yeah, need a motion for this. The first so moved on the first I think oh. We, we had already it. moved. It was on the floor. We didn't. Oh, okay. We didn't, unfortunately. That was uh, any further discussion. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Joy? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. I'll move second reading. Second. Uh, actually, uh, motion to suspend rules. Oh. Motion to suspend rules. Motion to suspend rules. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I move second reading. Second. second. So second. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. Councilor Yes. <coughs> yes. 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 So that was for the RK. Uh, Finn Ryan Road School. Uh, this one <coughs> is the similar request that you heard uh, for Leeds Elementary School, and I'll accept a motion. Move approval. Second. <coughs> any discussion or any other questions? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Move to suspend two readings rule. Second. Motions are made to suspend rules. <laughs> favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, roll call, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll accept a motion for the second reading. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? <laughs> roll call, please. Council O'Donnell? Yes. Council Yes. Council Yes. Council Yes. Council Yes. Yes. Next up is the financial order of the reprogram eighteen thousand dollars from the Bridge Street School Detention Basin project for the purpose of replacing bathroom partitions. I, and we still, uh, David, still recognize. So, if you'd like to speak to that, thank you, Council President. Um, this is an order uh, requesting that we reprogram money from a project that was done at Bridge Street School last summer. Uh, which involved extensive drainage and site improvements and repaving the entire uh, perimeter of the building. All the new parking areas were installed. Um, 
through some very, very competitive bidding, uh, great pricing from contractors, and I'd like to note uh, an amazing amount of assistance from the DPW. Uh, the DPW did all the engineering on this project for us and acted as the clerk of the works on the project. So we saved a lot of money. Uh, the project came out phenomenally. Uh, everybody at Bridge Street School from the principal on down is, is ecstatic with what the uh, project came out. So we now have money left over and this would be, money would be reprogrammed to install new composite bath partitions in all 14 stalls throughout the building. Uh, the ones there now are the old metal ones. Uh, they're pitted, they're old, they were put in in 1989 when the building was renovated and expanded and there were some sort of safety issues with the pitting with the children. Um, Bridge is the only school that has left in the district that has not had new partitions put in. So we felt this is a, a perfect opportunity to get that project done. And if we can align the stars, uh, we should be able to get this done during April vacation. Uh, we've already got the contractors waiting so uh, this is a re an order for reprogramming the money, approximately $18,000 to use towards the bathroom stall partition project. Any questions on that? I guess I do. When you say composite, are you talking about kind of particle board? Kind of? No, it's if you, it sort of looks like fiberglass. Uh, they're about an inch thick. Um, if you go into most sort of modern office buildings and, and, and institutional buildings, you'll see them. Um, they're a, uh, a composite made with some recycled materials, some fiberglass, some synthetic materials. They're great for the maintenance crews as far as cleaning. They're hard to deface and deform. Um, and unlike metal, there's no sharp edges, there's no rusting. Uh, it's, it's the material that you use now industry-wide. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Uh, okay. So any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Uh, yes. 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 That's been. And that's been approved in first reading. Um, is there a time pressure related to this, or? No. We okay. We can do second. So we'll be fine. We'll Next meeting, we'll, we should still be fine. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate your Thank time. You very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz. <coughs> this is the surplus parcel of property that this is in second reading. Um, do, 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 do. You, you guys recall this? This is the. Yep. Okay. Do you want me to read the order again? Wave reading. Wave reading. Okay. Um, I'll accept a motion. I move second reading. Second. Uh, any further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Um, this is upon the recommendation of Councilor Jesse Adams, Jesse M. Adams, uh, that the following changes um, to the City Council rules are adopted. Add on uh, number 32, non-member attendance at committee meetings. Uh, councilors may attend the council committee meetings, though they are not members of the committee, and may sit in the audience and participate as members of the public. They may address the committee consistent with its rules and in the same manner and to the same extent as non-councilors attending the meetings are allowed to address the committee. Uh, such counselors in attendance at a committee meeting may state their opinion on matters under consideration by the committee, but they shall not discuss matters as a quorum, nor shall they discuss topics that are not under the consideration by the committee. I need to refer <coughs> to committee on rules, or orders, appointments, and ordinances. Second. Any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And as just as a, as a note to that, uh, Councilor Adams is codifying something that's actually already codified under state law, but this discussion came up when we had the open meeting uh, law primer from um, the city solicitor, and it became clear that we were all a little confused as to how 
we should conduct ourselves in, in subcommittee meetings. And um, since that time, we were able to locate uh, uh, a finding in the town of Marlboro that showed that we would have been in <coughs> violation if we continued our practice of, 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 of participating counselors. Counselor? Uh, oh, just to note, even though this will go to the um, you know, to the referred commit referred to those committees, but I, in the meantime, this would not preclude any other subcommittee meetings at which, um, if we were to uh, post them as concurrent city council meetings, we could accommodate. Um, and actually, there may be some cases where we want to where we want to post as a concurrent city council meeting in order to provide if every councilor wanted to come to a hearing. For example, if a subcommittee was holding a hearing on something we might want, and the rest of the council wanted to participate in that hearing, we could hold it as a subcommittee meeting concurrent with the city council. Well, the, this is going to become germane pretty soon yep. when yep. the stormwater uh, flood control fee proposal comes before ordinance. And um, I, I think even even that is described as a meeting of the council as a whole. I would be, I personally would counsel that um, we abide by the rules that are proposed here, um, simply because it is so critical and it's so important that to receive a challenge, even though everyone was displaying good faith. This, um, making us vulnerable to a challenge because we've worked very hard on trying to maintain this as the best, abiding by all the best practices going forward. And this has been a two year process of public comment, public discussion, public participation, and anything that might somehow transmit that it is being gamed or played in some way, um, I don't think would serve anyone well. Uh, may, may I um, just sure along that? Yeah. But just. Um, it, it to follow then I, what I hear you saying is you think that it would be more appropriate to have a hearing before the um, ordinance committee at, at, to which it's referred and then an additional hearing for example if the whole if, if all of the members of the city council re wanted to have a hearing on that particular issue rather than being confined to the public comment session of a regular meeting. Well, we will have a regular mm -hmm. meeting, and it will be a city council meeting where we'll be discussing this as a, as a quorum body. So what I'm saying is to have a, a dedicated meeting mm -hmm. of the full city council to that I very important topic. I wouldn't rule that out. Okay. I wouldn't rule An that additional out. meeting yeah. rather than combined. Right. Okay. Respect. So j just to be clear, if I could ask Councilor Adams, so if we go by your rule in terms of, let's use as an example, the upcoming ordinance committee meeting around stormwater and we who are non-members of that committee choose to attend we could attend that meeting is that correct you could attend the meeting this is why I wanted the solicitor here to clarify this you could attend that meeting you can speak in public comment when if, if counselors have further questions and, and um, so if I mean there's there are three <coughs> members of that ordinance committee if say there are two other counselors in the gallery they can speak in public comment and that really should be end of their speaking. If they st if they're called on by the ordinance committee to have you know just to start weighing in at various points, right. if both of them start doing, should that, not do that. You shouldn't do that. As you said, so it, it it specifies you're basically attending as any other member of the public would be attending. I just want to right. But, make but, sure. but it's I I think it's even slightly more strict than that because a member of the public could be recognized and speak. That's true. And, and interact you know without those same restrictions. Thank you. So so um because because then you know. They can't discuss matters as a, as a quorum as members of the public, but but once um, you have, and I, this is where I was. I, th I thought we were covered as long as there's an open meeting. That's not the case. Um, but once you have a quorum, you have you have five counselors who are who are contributing. That's where you get into open meeting law okay. concerns. Thank you for putting this together too. Right. I mean, the, the concern, of course, is the counselor should not enjoy any privileges that the public does not enjoy in, in the course of this discussion. We do by it being a deliberative body because we will ultimately render a decision. But during the course of a public hearing that it's appropriate that we, we know our place. 
I'm, I'm just remembering a number of other issues we've had before the council that were very important issues, the education overlay district, the, a number of other things in which um, they were so important to the public, they warranted a dedicated city council hearing. And so uh, um, I don't want us to be in a position where um, we're somehow limited in our ability as a full council to hold hearings on such very important matters, dedicated hearings, rather than just the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, three-minute piece I, in the... I don't think this... I'm sorry. sorry. No, I'm happy to... No, I was just going to say, I think you mentioned this too. This doesn't preclude that. Even for the upcoming stormwater meeting, it may we may decide after that to have a dedicated meeting for the whole council. But I'm um, asking, does it preclude concurrent meetings? As we've done in the past. I, I don't know. We don't know. And in fact, actually, this will. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I would prefer to second? err on the side of right. caution and make them not concurrent meetings and make them yeah. separate meetings. Separate. That would be my preference. Um, and I don't see why we couldn't do that. Yeah. So uh, I, I think making them concurrent movie, uh, meetings muddies the waters a little. And doesn't and and I would prefer clear bright lines on this one. Okay. Uh, Councilor Don. Um, yeah, I just um, I guess I, I still crave clarification on it because um, this rule, if we passed it, doesn't change the open meetings law or the attorney general's decision in, in this. It's just Marvel it's case. So if we passed it, it's a good rule to have, but it wouldn't get us out of the predicament we no. were in the other the last council meeting would it no it, it, it not solve that problem what Councilor Adams is doing is taking essentially mass general law and making it part of our rules um, and it just to be to reinforce mm -hmm. that I mean one of the things that we want to convey is that I think this community has been assiduous about trying to abide by all these terms and conditions and as murky as they get in some cases so that we not only abide by the letter of the law but the spirit of the law and um, Councilor Adams is kind enough to, to devote some time to this. So, but the fact is the law still stands regardless of whether we have it as a, a rule in our rule book. It's, it's like we also can't kill people. But so right, maybe we should have a rule for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Councilor Adams Jesse might write something <laughs> on there. Uh, um, Mary? Uh, 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 I'm sorry. You, were still, you were not finished, right? You're right. Yes. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah. I did, and there. And there, I. I want. I th felt that it was something that needed to be corrected immediately, or at least pointed out and recognized, because, because we we have violated the law in this way in the past. But um, I had a conversation with the council president yesterday, and um, we thought that maybe it should go through the regular process. Um, so so I'm 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 removing that request. Um, and that, that way we can get some more discussion around it. That way, the the, the city solicitor has already seen this and um, and and approves of it. But um, it, it'll become an ordinance again, anyhow. One more question. Sure. And maybe I'm jumping the gun on asking questions before it ends up back here from, from um, the referred committee. But does this um, is the intent of this also to discourage? Uh, concurrent meetings of subcommittees that we've often had. We've had like social services meet with um, Ed Lou or. Well, those are joint committee hearings. Those are di those are different animals. Those are identified as joint committee hearings, and they're posted as joint. Committee. Okay. So those, that that's not the intent. So of this rule to. solely is to abide is is to reiterate and repeat. The law as it stands in the state, okay. Councilor Adams, and, and and it's you know it is redundant because we're bound to it anyhow as we've been stating. But but the reason why I want it in there expressly is because it it's correcting a problem that we've had with our own processes. So I thought it, we it, it might be better off to have it as an actual rule. Councilor Dunn. Um I, I'm just wondering though. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a good rule, but does it actually correct a problem? Because if you know one of us were to make a mistake and participate in the wrong way in a in the ordinance committee I meeting, for example, if there were a public an open meetings law kind of inquiry, the, the rules we have in, in the council wouldn't be relevant. It would be more the intent and 
the action and the things that were said at the time. I mean, do I have that? Do I have that right? The, the um, rule well, is good to, I mean, to sort of guide us. But. It, it's I'm not really sure what you're asking. I guess one of the things in, in the in the Marlboro case, um, if if you'll notice, what they did was it Marlboro? Yeah. They said that. Um, they state they said that yeah, this is an open meeting law violation, but um, they. they it, it it did occur at a public meeting, and they essentially they 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 um they were trying to comply, and they just failed. And I think that if we have a rule in place, I think that um it shows again that we're 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 tr we're trying to comply. And and I, and I think that because we've had the problem in the past, um I think it just merits clarification. It doesn't you know it won't spare us any 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 violation if if we don't follow the rule. Um, so, yeah. uh, I just think um, the open meetings law in Massachusetts is imperfect, you know, and the, the gray area, like if you read the Marlboro case, on the last page in the conclusion of it, it says that if counselors wish to ask questions of the subcommittee, they may do so without convening a meeting of the council, provided the participation is open and on the same terms as members of the public. And I think there's clear violations of that, like if we're sitting at our desks, you know, and um, then we're not on the same terms as members of the public. But, I mean, where, I, th I think that is a, a gray area that um, is, is not clarified by the rule, even though the rule is, is good to have, um, because the rule says the same thing, you know. And so I, I, I would just say we still have to be very cautious right. every, every time we call a meeting. And so my question would be, wh what is our policy going forward about, f for example, this ordinance, ordinance committee meeting on stormwater, Will it be a uh, city council meeting as well? Or did, uh, we decided it, it was, but are we going to? Well, one of the things that we're discussing is actually having a separate city council hearing dedicated, a meeting that's dedicated exclusively to that discussion, which will also obviously uh, include members of the ordinance committee um, and all the information that they have that might be. Right. Um, the Massachusetts general law trumps our rules every time and point in fact um, and you you point out one of the disparities in the decision I mean they seem to make the distinction between the gallery and the desks which was an important distinction for them um, and and I think as long as we and the fact is is that they may they found them in violation but at the same time they were not penalized so much it's that as Councilor Adams said that they were showing a good faith effort and I think what we do is, w as long as we're cognizant of what's important and how things might possibly be misinterpreted or misunderstood or may qualify as some aspect of violating the open meeting, that we err on the side of caution each time. Um, it, and it, in some cases, it makes deliberation somewhat clunky. Um, um, and clearly, and, and by the way, we have been in violation in the past, but also the laws changed recently too in 2012. So it, it's, we're also struggling to keep up and we're not alone in this. The communities all over the state are having the same issues, but we're, I mean, I think the very fact that we're having this discussion, the very fact that we're, we're codifying it and, and everything and that we, our commitment is to abide by the conditions in terms of the open meeting law, because personally I think we, we believe in the concept of open meeting and clear, transparent um, deliberation. So, I, I'm just thinking of the you know so the very important issue of the stormwater um, proposal, and that members of the public who want to be heard about that issue would probably prefer to be heard at a hearing, at which the full city council was present, um, and something like this might require that they have to come twice or you know to come to the ordinance committee hearing and then come again to the full city council unless what becomes then our common practice will be to defer those hearings as they come to ordinance we may say well since it's going to go to the full city council we might as well just kind of pass it up it has been our practice in this discussion and debate to have as many bites of the apple for the public to participate is not only in the sphere of education but also in the in it, and that is best practices and um, so the fact that 
there are more opportunities. I would look at it not requiring people to come twice. They don't have to. What I'm saying is it require it expands the opportunities for people to weigh in on this as issues come up and evolve in massage. And it, but eventually, of course, we're going to have to render a decision. But I don't think I don't think we fail the community in any way by having an extra meeting. Okay. So, uh, Councilor Spector, did you have? Councilor Adams. When I first started out drafting this rule. At first, the first thing I wrote, the first draft I, ha I had was, counselors may attend, but they may not speak, because I thought that would eliminate any gray area. <laughs> but then, but then, you know, that raised other concerns, you know, and, you know, and um, and I don't think we want that. Right. So, so I think I think the answer is there are gray areas, and I think I think I think um, council I think chairs of committees have to be aware of, of the open meeting law, this rule, and they just have to be on their toes about what counselors are are contributing. Um, to meetings when they're when they're not when they're visiting uh, subcommittee meetings and they're not actual members of that committee. Councilor Don, uh, is it is it true that um, even even a comment can be deliberation, right? And that's why there's no reply all on email and that kind of thing. So if we did have a three member body, the ordinance committee talking about the stormwater, and two other councilors showed up, and they each had comments on amendments. To the stormwater bill. Suddenly, we're deliberating on, on the stormwater bill. And so, should there not be, in that case, a city council meeting declared? Just a question. That that's how I interpret this. And so, we would need to have done that, perhaps. I mean, I, I don't think that's deliberation. I mean, I, I think the solicitor agrees with me because he he added some language to this. Um, I think that would be contributing as any member of the public. I mean, you can you can say your points. And then I, th I think I think that's where the line is. Where you, you if you're if you're going to be a counselor visiting a subcommittee meeting, you make your points, and then you have to stop. And I think if that happens, it's okay, even if the the members of the committee actually are, are hearing you and considering what you're saying, as long as you don't contribute any more. I mean that that's my understanding, but that's why I kind of hoped um, the city solicitor would be here, and maybe he he'd be willing to be at the ordinance committee meeting when when uh, when that committee takes it up so you can ask him some of those safe questions I, I think that would be important to do because I, I think you could construe um, expressing your opinion on matters within the jurisdiction of a committee as deliberation I really do so. and if I might, um, especially if there are follow-ups to the question, so anyone else who's on the committee is unclear and asks then the councilor to clarify a comment that they made. It becomes a it becomes a conversation. Yeah, you really can't do that. I mean, that that's 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 one of the things chairs have to keep in mind. That then it really does become it does become deliberation at that point. It really Unless does. it were concurrent, if it were a concurrent meeting that had been posted in 48 hours, it'd be okay to ask them what they meant by the comment that they just made. So I, I just feel like we we're getting we get really constrained by. Well, there may be there may be constraints, mm -hmm. and they <coughs> and as I said, personally my preference is rather than trying to game the law, to abide by the law and err on the side of caution. Um, if it constrains process, that's a different issue, and that becomes a problem. If, if the process is not advanced because the council cannot respond. But, I, but the council will always have an opportunity to respond under a full council meeting. So I, I'm not quite sure how I can envision. But it's, I mean, I think I, I take Councilor Adams' suggestion that this would be best to follow up with the solicitor if you can get him to uh, attend the, the meeting that this is going to be discussed in an ordinance. Council Spector. From my kind of lay reading of the intention of the open meeting law. It's that the community understands what the process is in advance and kind of identifies with it. So they would know. That's why I would in some ways not want to do the concurrent meetings. I think you mentioned this last week or last time we discussed this. The community expects things to be discussed at this meeting. That's the intention of the open meeting law. This is where people would think this is the final place where they can they can hear a discussion or they can come in in public session and make a comment on it. 
And so again, that's why I don't like the concurrent meeting thing, because we could just game, I think what you're saying is we could game the system, as we said last time, every meeting just listed as a concurrent meeting and say, well, now we've covered our butt on this one. But I think that actually is breaking the spirit, if not the letter of this thing. And I, I, I would feel very hesitant to do that, except in very rare cases. Um, and, and again, I think that what you're trying to do here, I really appreciate, so that we can attend the meetings but I actually think it's appropriate that we not deliberate at all with those committees, with, with other committees as, as, it, as they're doing the business that will come forward to the council. Um, and in terms of people needing to speak a number of times, people will come to this, I mean, I've seen people, as we all have, when they're really interested in an issue, they will speak multiple times at multiple meetings and, uh, and will come before the city council. And that's also where most of the public listens not only to us, but listens to other members of the public speak to issues. Yeah, just because of my reference to um, listing things as current, concurrent meetings was never intended as a way to game the system or game the I law. Understand. And the reason I, I, well, just because it's been mentioned twice, is a, that that's not what my intent was actually looking at the recommendation of the State Ethics Commission to the case in Marlboro. <coughs> The recommendation was, yes, you, you would have been wiser to list this as a concurrent city council meeting. So in that case there, they were advised that's what you really should have been doing, and that's from the State Ethics Commission. So again, I don't think that they would have warranted that as kind of just trying to play around and game it. And that's not what my intent was either, but really as a way for us to abide by in a way that, you know, if it's posted and people know this is an important issue and this is going to be discussed, they would come and see the members of the ordinance committee and other members of the city council who were very interested in that issue at a dedicated meeting to that very specific topic. So that's all. Uh, Councilor Klein. I think if we're doing <clears throat> due diligence um, by our constituents, by the residents of Northampton, that it's going to take a lot of forethought for us to think about, okay, so the ordinance committee is, for instance, with the stormwater meeting, the ordinance committee is going to sponsor this meeting. It's not a concurrent meeting. Um, we're going to have another meeting <clears throat> with the full city council. I think that it's not completely fair to the residents of Northampton to come to a committee meet, a committee hearing, thinking that they're coming to speak to the whole city council, and they find out when they get here, and, and they don't know that necessarily part of the process is a second meeting that's actually with city with the entire city council. So it means that we have to have a lot of forethought about saying, this is going to be the process. First, there's going to be this hearing that's just with ordinance. Then there's going to be a hearing two weeks from now with the entire city council. Because people have the right to choose where they want to have their voices heard. And I would bet that nine times out of 10, they're going to want to have their voices heard in front of the full city council. So I think it, it is a little bit complicated if we don't do it as a concurrent meeting. And we have to think about you know, how we're doing right by the residents of Northampton when we make these decisions. I just want to say too that <clears throat> deliberation is often a gray area. And, um, and, and this rule, if it passes and we follow it strictly, will be in compliance with the open meeting law. And if it doesn't pass, well, we still have to, pa we still have to follow what's in here anyhow. So. <laughs> Well, that this is yeah. this is being yeah. referred to ordinance, and I, I have to note this is the longest discussion we've ever had on a referral that I can recall for us. Yeah. But the, um, the the conversation could be continued in ordinance, and I think it's a very good conversation to have. So, thank you. Um, next up, this is uh, well, look, this is from ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> The, this is uh, this is the first reading. Uh, this is a recommendation from the from ordinance, uh, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the code of ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising 44-3 of said code, providing that accounts um, be it ordained the city council of the city of Northampton, the city council assembled as follows: the section 44-3 of the code of ordinances is the city of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended so that such section shall read as follows and includes the deletion of number three under um, section C, printings by the Committee on Rules and Ordinances, and then reorders all the other existing orders as they are now. Um, 
does someone from ordinance want to speak to this? And actually, I'll accept the motion and put it on the floor first. I'll move it. Second. And well, actually, this came to us uh, um, from the uh, secretary, the clerk to the council, um, Mary Madura, who pointed out that there is a reference here to the uh, printing being done by the ordinance committee. It's not something that we do or ever have done. I'll actually let Mary elaborate if that's okay. Sure. by the city solicitor in which they took, um, took out references to anything having to do with claims um, and other small duties like this. Right. That so one being printing. <clears throat> right, so this is cleaning up um, after the fact that claims has been, is no longer part of uh, ordinance and uh, the so the, the ordinance committee is no longer required to do printings. What did they print? <laughs> what would they, what, uh, possibly there letters? Is, there is an email from the city solicitor attached in which he agrees that this is um, a good appropriate thing, appropriate amendment. to take up. Yeah, and renumber. It's, it's a renumbering too. Yeah, so it's renumbering all the others after three. So there are now 24 <coughs> items as opposed to 25. Any other questions about this? It's essentially a house cleaning. Uh, all those in favor, please. Uh, or ordinance. What's, uh, what's it's that? It's an ordinance. Oh, it's an ordinance. I'm sorry. That's right. Roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Uh, and then... Here's where we um, adopt the rules of the uh, remote meeting participation. Uh, yeah, I'm accepting a referral to uh, on or to ordinance of the rule that we described before about remote participation in meetings. I move to refer. Second. Councilor Adams. I won't get into it. There's just one. This is basically the mayor's with one small change. Yeah. You have an amendment. Well, it's. In, well, no, because it's just a, it's not, it's um, its own, it's its own separate right. document. Right, <laughs> I was going to say. But it is, yeah. A recommendation. Um, the, the ordinance committee won't be taking this up at its next meeting, right? The next meeting for ordinance committee is only stormwater? Yes. Yes, thank you. Well, we actually, it's on March 10th? Or, no, next week? <coughs> Tuesday, the 25th? About the stormwater? Yes, that's right, right. But the March 10th, we also have um, all of those other committees. March 10th is the other ordinance mm -hmm. meeting, the next ordinance mm -hmm. meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. March 20, I mean March, February, 20, February 25th. February 25th. Okay, well, let's vote on the referral. All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, updates from the council president, I have none, and committee chairs. I actually have one question. Sure. Just since we've talked quite a bit about the... Uh, the need for a separate hearing of the city council on the stormwater ordinance. Um, when we, and that will that will become relevant to the public who come to the ordinance committee meeting on Monday, uh, Tuesday night. <coughs> have one scheduled for the full city council. We might want to, at this point, be looking at our calendars, since we are at, we're you know kind of looking at a time frame there that we're hoping to get this back to the full council. So if we want to have a separate hearing by the full city council, we might want to be looking at that. Uh, my guess is, and my own feeling would be that we are going to want to have that another meeting. <clears throat> However, I'd like to wait until we see who, I, I, and I hope people will show up at this meeting. Um, and I hope a lot of people show up, and I hope that would be a reason to have another meeting like this. But. We can email in terms of meeting times, right? We can do a Google Calendar. That's perfectly acceptable. So, though I agree, and I think we should do another meeting. I'd, I'd just like to wait and see what well, happens at this at this particular. If meeting. I might, um, the reason that we're having a special meeting on the 25th was because we've been advised that there's a hope that this would come to the council by March 6th, and then a second reading again mm -hmm. on 
the tr on the I mean March. That's a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean so I mean they're really looking at having us finish get a second reading by by the 20th of March. So we really should be looking at our calendars and try to get something next week. Uh, I really for the full council if we want to do a separate Good point. You know, so maybe the next <coughs> night, you know, if we do the ordinance on on you Tuesday say, night, yeah. maybe on on um I mean, if, if, the, if the sentiment is that we really should have an additional meeting rather than a concurrent one, we really better look at our calendars right now, because... You're talking about Wednesday the 26th. Oh, well, Wednesday's not... Uh, yeah, so I think you really... Wednesday's not going to work for me. So maybe Thursday, if people well, are... I can't do I'd Thursday. I'd like to just yeah. open the discussion a little more about having the extra meeting. Again, I, my, yeah. I'm leaning that way, but there's also the side that we... I think you were pointing out in a different way that, you know, we probably should have the concurrent meeting. Well... Yeah. But... Again, the council is the place where I would like to, that's where people yeah. expect things to happen. Right. So I'm, I'm, although leaning towards it, I would also speak, could hear the other side, which is no, we do a meeting at ordinance and that at the council meeting where people expect to tune in and see it deliberated. So here's a concern just the other way, even though again, I would support having a separate meeting, is if we've already had all of this discussion, you know, we've, Ordinance people have discussed it at ordinance, and a lot of people show up. We have a dedicated hearing, and we discuss it, and everybody, you know, says their piece. There is the side that then we come here, and like I've heard you say it, and I've said it, even if we say the same thing, then it could either look stale, or we're not really debating the issues because we've already debated them. This should be the place we do that, even if that meeting we know is going to be a very long evening. That evening, this is where people do tune in to watch that debate. And so a debate that we're all having, I want to make sure it's here, it's vibrant. If there is, you know, if there is vibrancy to it, this is the place where there, there should be that vibrancy. I, I said a quick question, maybe it's for the, the council clerk. My understanding is the meeting on Tuesday has been posted as a city council, full city council. Oh, good. Is that correct? <coughs> has that, it been posted as concurrent? I don't know if you would. Take a look, because yeah. if be, it is, then. That would be good to know, because I have some amendments changes that I'm presenting and um, it'd be helpful to know if I can actually you know really contribute rather than just make, make my comments and leave how do we know I, if it's been posted that way I posted did it, you send an email I posted it the day after your ordinance meeting um, I just believe it was February 11th February but I don't 11th? have it in front of me I'm just looking for the email. I think I posted it February 11. So take a quick look. So let's see, here's the schedule and committee on um, yes. social I services. Have, no, I have one here actually, and it says, I'm opening it up right now. No, that's not the one, I'm sorry. Here it is. Uh, for ordinance. To the February 25th ordinance. City uh, ordinance and city council. So rules and ordinances. Uh, it's. it's no, that's, not it. so. that's not it. That's not it. Oh, here we. Uh, oh, potential meeting. Oh, here. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Mary. I don't see them posting for the February 25th meeting. Stormwater ordinance. That was your, just a question from you. At the. Um, there we go. Is this it? It's just two, right? Yeah. Is that there? It is. Here it is. And city council. Yes. Oh, so it's yes. a concurrent yes. and city it's council. It's committee on rules, ordinance, appointments, and ordinances, and city council. Uh, I, I would ask then, um, since it is already posted as a concurrent city council meeting, well, that first of all, when we do as much press to let people know and encourage especially since there may be additional amendments presented at that meeting. Mm -hmm. As many city councilors who can be present, be present, and we treat that as a regular city council meeting for that portion. Since we have such a limited amount of time for additional mm -hmm. hearings, I know we're still trying to. Uh, Councilor Klein. I just want to um, respond to Councilor Spector. I wasn't necessarily advocating for doing concurrent meetings ongoingly. I was just trying to say that we need to be clear about the process for the residents of Northampton so that if we are, in fact, going to do non-concurrent meetings, we're going to make it clear that this is the committee hearing and then you will have a later chance to speak. 
So that that was more it was more of a process. Than <coughs> I just want to say I agree with Councilor Spector's last comments about um, having the discussion here and, and allowing for that comment here. I don't, I don't think we need I don't think we need um, after the ordinance committee. I don't think we need any further hearings. That, that's my opinion. I think this has been a long process and an inclusive one. And it seems as such now that this is this meeting has already been posted as a committee on ordinance a, a meeting of the committee on ordinance and and uh, and the city council that it does address some of the concerns and issues about that and um, it also will allow the public to weigh in on both events when it comes before the council and in this special meeting so we don't need to um, and I agree with Councilor Spector. You know, we have the meetings. We're in for the long haul, even even past eleven o'clock if it's required. But the idea is to to. So. Um, I guess my question then about the February twenty fifth meeting, even though it's being posted as a concurrent meeting of the City Council, is it the feeling? Is it the consensus of the body here that we actually only treat it as an ordinance committee meeting, except for those few things that. I mean, not to game the system or whatever, but to allow for the counselor to present his amendments and have them considered and... Right. I, it would be chaired yeah. by the ordinance chair, and uh, he would be the presiding officer. Counselor, uh, I believe there are a couple of counselors with, with interest in, in proposed amendments. Should they be allowed to sit at the table? Um, I think for purposes of the Marlboro case, just since they seem to make this distinction between the gallery and the and the and the table, I think I don't think it's inappropriate for them to submit the amendment. I think it would be just to err on the side of caution again that non ordinance committee members sit in the gallery. And um, you know, we're making this up as we go along, but I'm just thinking that that would be the best way to proceed. That Councilor Adams and, and Councilor O'Donnell, if he has some amendments or any other councilor has any amendments, to introduce them there uh, so that they can be vetted in ordinance and so that by the time he comes to the council floor, there's a relatively clean document that comes before the council to debate. Uh, councilor Spector. First of all, I think, uh, thank you for that question. I think you're looking for some guidance. And yeah, I, I actually would like to see it be an ordinance committee meeting. Refrain from those of us who are not introducing other things. I would, I would, even though we could, I would like to refrain. And I know I'll be biting on the bit back here to jump in there, but I'm going to try and refrain me from saying anything because I'd like, again, I'd like people to have a chance to hear those arguments and hear them fresh. I think there's an importance to that. That question of us debating things and not knowing what we're each going to say in advance. We've already heard it, and then we come here and it's like a you know, public's listening, and it feels a little staged at that point. Well, it's, it, we've seen that played out on budget discussions. When the, by the time it comes to the council yeah. floor to vote on the budget, people think that we've just sort of right. summarily just voted on something. When point in fact, there's been long, ongoing discussion, and deliberation. Well, I, and I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying that I mean we distinguish between hearings and just our typical public comment session at a, at a city council meeting. Typically, we give a little bit more latitude to the public mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a hearing setting, and we give them more time to make comments. And there's some back and forth. Mm -hmm. If we're reserving our council role as a hearing to a council meeting on the March 6th or the, or the 20th, that that we just need to know that that's going to be the limited scope. I would assume the limited scope is going to be public comment and no back and forth and not what might be expected of the public at what would be considered a hearing by the City Council. So basically they're not going to get a hearing at which they will have that kind of broad latitude that they might in, in another meeting right. in a back and forth you, discussion. You're making the distinction that in the Council meeting it will not it won't be, be as freewheeling as it would be in a hearing. Yes, that's true. We will we'll abide by the rules of decorum. And that the public will, once we start and convene, the public will not be allowed to uh, comment beyond that point um, unless we address them, which we've done in the past too. But I'm uh, just noting that there won't be an opportunity for the city council to hold a dedicated hearing on the stormwater ordinance. 
Uh, I'm it just it's seeming that way to me unless we push it off. Well, the, this no is April. the de facto one in that it will be, it's, and in fact, I'll make this announcement now, now that I do have an announcement that on February 25th in these chambers at 630, there will be a uh, special meeting of the ordinance committee and city council dedicated to the discussion of uh, a hearing of the uh, stormwater flood control fee uh, um, system. So, And the reason I bring this up is it goes back to Councilor Klein's point. Those people who see that and hear what you're saying will come and expect to see members of the city council to whom they would speak sitting at the table. And instead, they'll see them scattered among themselves in the audience. I, th I, I think that's a fine distinction. Look, some councilors might not show up. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the public's perception of how, I mean, because this is the same when we've had the neighborhood meetings as well, that the, when, when the public speaks, they always believe that they're speaking at some point and hope that, they, that, that their points that they're making are to the people who will eventually make the decision. Right. So, and, I, and I, I don't think that changes by sitting there or here. I think what does change by sitting there or here is the um, appearance that it's actually almost a done deal on some level. That, that it, speaking to a Councilor Spector's point is that you do not have the, the new invigorated and vital debate that occurs on the Council floor because if it's fully vetted by the time it gets to the Council floor, then it's just, a, a, you know, a, a, a vote. And so that is part of the process. So that's, that's my hope. I think, I think given the fact that, you know, and I think uh, trying to conform to best practices and even best practices as they aren't defined in this case, I think it is in our best interest to function this way and uh, give primacy to the ordinance committee and function as an ordinance committee hearing, but with the city council present and allowed to introduce amendments and um, not be subject to mass open meeting law violations. But beyond that, I don't think we should presume that we are functioning as a city council. Since we, do you want to say something? Yep. Since we are um, on television now, and just to remind people, I want to thank all the councilors for having local ward meetings on this, which were almost like hearings in a sense. They were very freewheeling. Mm -hmm. And we've had multiple meetings on this where people could speak that I just want to thank everybody for doing that and the energy that went into that and so I think to uh, again I think to bring this finally to the council I think people have had a lot of opportunity but I, I do appreciate your thoughtfulness on that and your question before about how do you want that particular meeting run uh, okay so the uh, we are now at the point of the meeting where I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. There's no second. Second. You guys want to discuss that? <laughs> no? Not debatable. <laughs> no, not debatable motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you again all very much. Aye. Thank you.